Welcome back to the Faculty Factory podcast, friends. It's Kim Skorupski here at Hopkins. And today we're going to talk briefly about emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence or EQ? EQ stands for emotional quotient, piggybacking on the IQ, intelligence quotient. And if you go to the Google machine and you type in EQ, Emotional intelligence is defined as the ability to understand, use, and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. And you'll see a really nice comparison of IQ and EQ side by side. And there's this really kind of nice uh, high-level overview. For IQ, it's the ability to think. EQ references the ability to feel. IQ will get you through school. EQ will get you through life. IQ is not possible to raise. However, EQ, you can raise your emotional quotient. So you can get a better score on EQ if you work at it. Not so easy with IQ. IQ cannot be earned and EQ can be learned. So why does this matter? Because in academic medicine, we want to be the best we can be. We're all overachieving, uh, high type A driven leaders. And so when we learn how to combine good EQ with our IQ, that's going to lead us um, to greater heights than we even thought possible. So that's um, emotional intelligence. Now, when we here at Hopkins have our leadership courses, we talk about emotional intelligence and trying to understand how to, first of all, gauge our EQ, because many of us in younger schools, in our grade school, we learned what our IQ was, but we didn't know, no one gave us a score with EQ. So what is our EQ? my emotional intelligence? How do I know where I need to work or uh, how do I need to improve or how can I grow my score? And I'm not uh, I'm not published in this space. I'm not a psychologist. And so there's probably someone out there who would love to be on the Faculty Factory podcast. So please sponsor them or encourage them to come and be on the podcast to talk about it. But I always like to think of the Myers-Briggs type inventory, the MBTI, and then more recently, the Clifton Strengths inventory. And these are just two of many standardized personality profile tools that we use oftentimes in many leadership courses you'll take, which gets at the first component of emotional intelligence. Because if we think of emotional intelligence very um, easily or like thumbnail version of it, it's knowing yourself to better manage yourself, and then knowing others to better manage your relationship with others. So again, knowing self, managing myself, knowing others, managing those relationships, which is why in our leadership courses, we always start with a Myers-Briggs, a Clifton Strengths, because we want to get to know ourselves better and really appreciate where um, when we go get in the grip or are under stress, Where are we going to fall apart? Where um, is it more likely that we're going to have problems? And so there's a lot, again, in emotional intelligence where you can get into that literature. Um, Daniel Goleman is credited with his model is, again, that self-awareness, which is the ability to know one's own emotions, strengths, weaknesses, drives, values, and goals, and recognizes their impact on others. So self-awareness. Self-regulation involves controlling or redirecting one's disruptive emotions and impulses and adapting to changing circumstances. So the first two are self, self self-awareness, and then self-regulation. And then social skill, Goldman talks about managing relationships to move people in the desired direction. Empathy, considering other people's feelings, especially when making these decisions. And motivation, being driven to achieve for the sake of achievement. So That motivation is like a a fifth um, entry. You'll see this in Harvard Business Review, 1998, What Makes a Leader. So it's it's old school. It's it's one of the foundational pieces. But I like to think of it as a four parts again. Knowledge of self to better manage myself. Knowledge of others to better manage 
and, and have better relationships, healthier relationships. And then another model by um, Reuven Barr on talks about there's this nice flow chart, this nice, um, well, this would be, um, well, it's a flow chart essentially, or a nice graphic about adaptability, interpersonal relationships, intrapersonal relationships, and stress management, all um, circling around a general mood of optimism and happiness. So um, Reuven Baran talks about having uh, an overall sense of well-being is built into having good interpersonal skills, intrapersonal skills, that's the self-awareness, manage, learning to manage our stress and being adaptable. So you can see, you know, the elements of what we try to think about when we are trying to go to de- in, grow into leadership positions is this awareness of, if I'm going to um, melt down, have a meltdown, where, where is that going to most likely occur? And if you've taken the Myers-Briggs, um, I'll start with that one. Real quickly, the Myers Briggs has four two letter codes. So the what fills your balloon, what gives you energy is you are either an extrovert or an introvert. You get your energy from being around people, which means you're an extrovert. When you're alone, that that, that builds your energy, you're more introverted. So if my battery gets filled up when, when I'm with other people. I'm an extrovert. When my battery gets deflated or um wanes down or uh decreases my battery loses charge it's because i'm not around people if i'm an extrovert and then opposite of that introverts their battery gets charged when they're by themselves or alone or in smaller groups of people and if they're with larger groups of people introverts is, their batteries will drain so how do you like to get your energy are you extroverted or introverted the second so that you're either an E or an I, extroverted, introverted. The second pairing is you are either a sensor or an intuitor. And the intuitor means you're an N. They skip the I since the I was already taken by introverts. So you're an S or an N. A sensor gets information by way of the senses. Whatever I can see, taste, touch, feel, smell, hear, that's what I'm going to trust. I trust my senses. If you are more a metaphorical, abstract thinker, big picture, forest versus tree kind of person, you're more intuitive. Intuitors are more likely to, you'll say, they'll say things like, I got to trust my gut. I got to go with my gut with these things. So sensing or intuiting, how do you like to get your information? You're either extroverted or introverted, E or an I. You are either an S or an N, a sensor or an intuitor. And now the third pairing is, how do you like to make decisions? Are you a thinker or a feeler? Thinkers are all in their head. Feelers are all in their heart. Thinkers will remove themselves from the people component and look at the the facts, just the facts. Feelers are going to jump right in with the people and they're going to be making decisions based on their hearts and relationships and other people. And then the fourth dichotomy, so you're an E, an I, an S, an N, a T, an F. The final four-digit code would be you are judging or perceiving. Judging is close the loop, finish the job, get her done, make a decision, get to the closure versus P's, perceiving people, how they interact with the world is more open-ended, more let's kind of think about this. Let's travel, meander down this path. We don't want to rush to close things off because we want to explore all of our options. They kind of get that charge by last minute. They're not necessarily driven by checking things off of a a list. They don't want to arbitrarily or rush to closure when they've not felt like they've examined all possible options. So J or P, J's like to have a list, get it done, close the loop, P's want to take some time and explore options. Now, because of that, you can understand where or you might be able to figure out where these um, challenges might be for emotional intelligence. And in fact, there is um, a nice set of um, information around uh, people who are various Myers-Briggs types and how they cope with, for example, conflict and where 
their um, challenges are around emotional intelligence. When you're under stress, so think about you're the, in the Myers-Briggs language, it's in the grip, when you're in the grip. So when you're under stress, you, maybe you're not eating, you're not sleeping well, maybe COVID happened. All these 16 possible Myers-Briggs types Under stress, they tend to perform or exhibit certain behaviors that through the data and through this this is decades of research, they tend to exemplify certain characteristics. So, for example, I'm an ENTJ. I'm an extroverted, intuitive, thinking, judging person. And when I'm in the grip or under stress, I go to being hypercritical, angry very controlling. I feel trapped. I get overly emotional and have the sense of being all alone. And strangely enough, that's exactly how I feel. And it tends to be the opposite of what I am. So I, I'm i not typically very emotional, but when I'm feeling under stress, I will get very emotional, very angry, and get very sad, feel like I'm all alone. That's a kind of like that under stress, knowing how I would react as an ENTJ. Completely opposite of the, the 16 different Myers-Briggs types. If you're an ISTJ, you're introverted, you're a sensor, you're a thinker and a judger. When you're under stress, you will feel, you will withdraw. You'll feel very burned out. You're going to get overly rigid and also become hypercritical. Let's look at some, the feeling, um, the S's and the S. So if you might be an ISFP, for example, if you're introverted, sensing, feeling, and perceiving, you will lose self-confidence. You will become passive. You will withdraw. You will be neglectful and also critical. And I'm looking at something different, the ESFP, extroverted, sensing, feeling, perceptive, perceiving person. You'll be impulsive, overcommit, confused, pessimistic, paranoid. Uh, let me give you one more. How about an INFP, introverted, intuitive, feeling, perceptive? Take on too much. Under stress, you will be overwhelmed. You'll be more rigid, perfectionistic. You'll feel inadequate. So there are certain ways that um, based on our personality preferences, we will go when we are in stress. Now, another another tool that I think I mentioned was the Clifton Strengths Inventory. That's another tool that will help you identify you and your group, your colleagues, your group members, your, your staff to un- identify your innate top most strengths. And similarly, Like the Myers-Briggs, when you get your four-letter code that helps you know yourself to better manage yourself and anticipate where you're going to go haywire when you are under stress, the Clifton Strengths also has that same, um, the same countermeasures because the idea is that there is success um, when it's done in excess will lead to weakness. So weakness is um, any overused strength that when we go too far afield that it's, it gets us in trouble. So for example, my top five clipped, and I think they're, gosh, I'm not a certified Clifton strengths um, trainer. Two of our colleagues here at Hopkins, um, doctors, Rachel Salas and Charlene Gamaldo introduced us to, and they're, they're into Clifton strengths and they're both certified trainers. I think there are 40 some 44 odd um, Clifton strengths, and actually, Rachel Salas did record um, a podcast. You could check her out and, and learn more about the Clifton strengths. But so, for example, my five, my top five are input, strategic, futuristic, achiever, and intellect. So that made sense when I met with the, the counselor coach after Clifton strengths, and she described. Okay, if your top five are input, strategic, futuristic, achiever, intellect, she went through and defined and and we, and I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. I love number one. I thought, well, what the heck does input mean? That I love to get data. I'm always 
I read every email I get. I sort things. I love being able to pull something from a file, you know, six clicks deep and give it to somebody. I love data and information. So input made sense to me. Strategic, yes. I'm always like a planning person. Futuristic, yes. Always thinking about the future and what's going to happen in the future. Achieving, absolutely. Type A, just like everybody else. A lot of us driven to um, achieve an intellect very much my brain is like, a, I would say my brain is a zombie. My brain craves other brains and I, I need to be learning all the time. So when I am the shadow side or in the grip or in stress or overwhelmed, the, the bad side of those things, the shadow side of these strengths are the weaknesses. So input, when I overdo my input, that might look like being a pack rat and having too much stuff. So that could look like being overwhelmed with so much stuff that then you start drowning in the stuff. Strategic overplayed, that strength overplayed, is that I'm always planning. Is Maybe I'm always over-programming my life and over-scheduling. And I, I don't like any, any unexplained deviations. I don't like to deviate from the plan. And it puts me into a little bit of a tizzy um, if I don't have... Uh, a plan or a schedule. Futuristic, when that's overplayed, I'm it's too cloudy. I could be too much of a dreamer, too much in, you know, in metaphors and abstract thinking. And then it's hard for people to understand where I'm trying to go, which I actually know from the podcast. I know I tend to over talk and I over talk, I think I know because I feel like sometimes I'm way up in the clouds. And so also I over talk because I'm an extrovert and extroverts talk to think as opposed to you lovely introverts who think before you talk. I'm very envious of that. But the achievers, um, the achiever part of me, that when that's overplayed, uh, I just overdo it. I become you know, a work a workaholic. And then finally, the intellect part of me, you think that's a, that's a good thing to be intelligent and have the high intellect, but that can come across as being aloof, that I'm too much in my head and not enough in my heart. So, so both of these tools, just these two, for example, the Myers-Briggs type inventory, the MBTI, and this Clifton Strengths inventory give you an insight into yourself and ourselves to identify our natural born, natural predispositions towards strengths, but also the opposite of that is where we're going to fall down when we do struggle, where we are likely to mess up, and then how can we then learn how to mitigate the those you know those problems and actually the myers briggs has a really nice flow chart that we incorporate in our leadership and it and it's an easy way of thinking those two middle codes so remember your extrovert or introverted sensing um intuiting thinking feeling judging perceiving those two middle types you're an s or an n a t or an f what we sh- we show is that um the auxiliary codes, you go from one to the other. So when you're having a problem, you're trying to uh, negotiate some conflict or mediate a conflict, or actually trying to understand where you went wrong in in a meeting or in a relationship, going through all four of those in the two middle codes, going from sensing to intuiting, sliding down into thinking, and then scooching over to feeling, so asking yourself questions to stretch yourself to both sides of ourselves, because again, the Myers-Briggs is not like you are either this or that. It's a sliding continuum. So you're just, just because you're a thinker doesn't mean you have no capability of feeling naturally. But so what do I, what do I mean? So in times of conflict or, um, you really found yourself in a pickle, start with the sensing, start with a sensor. And if you are a sensor, you're going to say, all right, what are the facts? What have you or others done to resolve this situation? What worked? What didn't work? What resources do we have available? Those might be some questions. Sensing, you know, start with sensing. What what can we actually do right now? See, taste, touch, feel, hear, smell. What can we do? Facts, facts, facts. Then slide over to your intuition. Okay, now that we know the facts, what we've done to um, what worked, what didn't work, what resources available, go to an intuitive mindset. Are there other ways we can look at this? What are the connections to larger issues or other people? What theories address this? 
what are all the possible ways of understanding this? What haven't we thought about? That's using your intuition, getting into the more abstract. What is our gut telling us? We know move away from this, the sensing into the bigger metaphorical abstract, what could be possibility. Once you've done that and asked yourself or your group, you've gone through those kind of questions, you know, slide down now into thinking. What is the thinking part of this? Well, what are the pros and cons of each option? What are the logical consequences of each? What could this, what impact of this decision would have on our other priorities? So very thoughtful, in the head, logical, um, orderly, sequential, rational. And then finally, um, allow yourself to dip into your heart and go, all right, how does each of these alternatives or approaches fit my values, fit the department's values? How are the people going to be affected? How will our patients um, be affected by this change? And how will these options contribute to harmony or disharmony? So you see different, you know, by asking ourselves different questions as leaders, we can flex our muscles that are on the opposing ends of these continuum. We can practice being a sensor if we're more of an intuitor. Or if you're a sensor, you can practice being an intuitor just by asking questions and flexing. And that's even easier when you uh, when you embrace this Clifton Strengths model of saying, "Oh gosh, in my team, I'm an input, a strategic, futuristic achiever, an intellect, and it's so awesome that I, in my team I have someone who's a connector, who's a relator, that they're really great about the feelings, so then I can capitalize and leverage my colleagues and the staff and my my friends in the lab. We can all uh, leverage each other's strengths." to help us go through all the thought processes, to go through that iteration of problem solving just by naturally uh, relying on our strengths. So that's kind of a mini overview of emotional intelligence that starts with, you know, knowledge of self is beginning is the beginning of all wisdom. So we start with ourselves, understand ourselves, manage ourselves better and our emotions, and then learn others and how to manage those relationships. So I wanted to end, I think with a, um, oh yeah. So Daniel Goleman has this nice uh, leadership style. So, you know, the application of this. So once I know myself, I know my EQ, I know where I have opportunity to improve my uh, better understanding of myself when I'm in the grip or when, you know, my shadow side, how can I, you know, help, uh, Mitigate that by either working on it myself or surrounding myself with people who have different strengths that can help, who can help me, um, improve on my, um, my goals of trying to be more thoughtful or more of a feeler, uh, or et cetera. Well, the, the, um, Daniel Goldman has these six leadership styles at a glance. This is another nice table I found in a uh, Harvard Business Review that's uh, that this nice matrix that talks about six styles of leadership that spring from different components of emotional intelligence. And he summarized the styles, their origin, when they work best, and uh, the impact on the organization's climate. And what I like about this, I'll just kind of I'll list to you for you the three, the six leadership styles. And I'll start with the negative ones. Coercive, pace setting, and um well, just the two, they're just too negative. So coercive and pace setting, the impact on climate is negative. So a coercive leadership style is the essence of that leadership style is they demand immediate compliance. That's the do what I tell you to do. You, you, that style works best in a turnaround situation, in a crisis or with problem employees. The overall impact on the climate is very negative. And then the pace setting that leadership style is setting a high standard for performance, saying, do as I do it now. And it works best when you want to get quick results from highly motivated and competent team, but the overall impact is negative. Um, so coercive and pace setting, maybe not the best. There, the other four remaining positives, um, I'll give them an order of this affiliative, democratic, and coaching. And then the most strongly positive is authoritative. So affiliative essence of leadership style is creates harmony and builds emotional bonds. That style, affiliative, works best when you want to motivate people during times of stress and heal disagreements. It's a very positive impact. 
You can also, based on your leadership style or your emotional intelligence, another positive style is the democratic style. That essence is forging consensus through participation. That question is, what do you think? Think of a, a typical example of a democratic leader is, what do you think? And that's highly associated with collaboration and team leadership and communication. That style works best when you want to obtain input from employees and build consensus. That's democratic. Very positive impact on the climate. That affiliative leadership style is all about creating harmony, building emotional bonds, and the Democrat is forging consensus. The third positive impact leadership style is coaching, developing people for the future. That essence is developing people for the future. It works best when you want to help an employee develop their strengths and achieve optimal performance. So think of employees as your learners, your trainees, uh, patients, uh, colleagues. That impact, again, is positive. So those three are positive. Affiliative, creating harmony, democratic, forging consensus, coaching, developing people for the future. And the most strongly positive, as I mentioned, is authoritative, not authoritarian, authoritative. And that essence of leadership style is mobilizing people toward a vision. And the example is come with me, authoritative, come with me. It's related to self-confidence, empathy, change catalyst. This style works best when a specific direction is needed or changes require a new vision. Again, most strongly positive. So you can see how emotional intelligence rolls up into different leadership styles. Coercive and pace setting, negative. Affiliative, democratic, coaching, and then authoritative. So there's a lot to learn about emotional intelligence. Definitely check it out. Um, and again, Go, go back to your offices of faculty affairs, faculty development. They have lots of information and wisdom and certainly the passion and to help you in your careers. Hello, everybody. It's your podcast producer, Casey. And I just wanted to let you know that as of September 1st, 2023, this podcast has had nearly 76,000 total downloads and YouTube views from listeners in 84 different countries. On the Faculty Factory website, facultyfactory.org has drawn nearly 40,000 web visits from users in 122 different countries. It's truly an international platform, and we would love to invite you, no matter where you are, to be a guest on this show. Our host, Dr. Skrupski, makes the experience very engaging, relaxing, and it's all recorded on Zoom. So no matter where you are, we would love to have you join her for an episode. As producer, I'll make any edits that you'd like, so there's no pressure to nail it on the first go or anything like that. We just want to hear from different faculty around the world so we can learn from each other. Reach out if you'd like to be a guest. You can contact us on facultyfactory.org slash contact, or you can email Dr. Skorupski directly at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.